Welcome to the Kessler Law Firm podcast. I'm Michael Kessler, your host, and we're joined today by my good friend, Cliff Barnes. Cliff, I understand that you uh, ventured into the trial forum last week. First uh, jury trial in 17 years, Mike. Well, let us hear about it. Well, we got a two-word verdict, which is always an um, encouraging sign. Um, it was, uh, this should go under the unwinnable cases, I think, because if you're a law enforcement officer or a lousy lawyer, you would look at this and you would say, uh, this guy is guilty, dead to rights. Uh, why has he got this tricky lawyer wasting all his money to defend him? To tell you the truth, uh, uh, one of the courthouse deputies said that to me last week while your jury was deliberating. Ah, okay, good. That makes it even sweeter. So I, uh, it, it, the case was about three years old. I got it after another lawyer had done nothing for a year, hadn't done discovery, hadn't uh, subpoenaed the video, hadn't basically done anything but set him for a, a plea, a plea of guilty a year after he got the case. So uh, the family panicked and Somehow I got uh, hired to represent him. And I, when I read the police report before I saw the video, I definitely would have said this was an unwinnable case. What about it was unwinnable? Well, it was a high speed fleeing and eluding on the turnpike. Uh, and he had a smell of alcohol and he was incoherent and couldn't stand up. But the, the worst part about it wasn't that. It was that he was going the wrong way on the Florida turnpike for 11 miles, four and a half miles of which the trooper was able to capture him on video before he pushed him off the road in what's called a pit maneuver. Let me get this right. Your client was on video driving the wrong way on Florida's turnpike with a police officer behind him videotaping the driving. Exactly. The trooper, I mean, the bottom the line is the trooper. Lights and sirens going. Oh, Yes, and my guy was in a little Prius, but it weighs about several hundred pounds, and he's he's in the lane where semis are going 80, 90, uh, and uh, Suburbans and big vehicles like that. They all got it out of his way, thank God, and the trooper actually saved his life and probably lots more. The trooper, uh, an amazing act of courage, uh, they didn't intercept him. The trooper got behind him with lights and siren and, and headlights, of course, flashing. And um, so the oncoming traffic at least was alerted to the fact that there was a problem, but he couldn't get him to pull over and he had to eventually uh, run him off the road to get him stopped. You mentioned a pit maneuver. What's that? Pit maneuver is where the trooper comes up behind you and either hits your left bumper, uh, turns right into your left bumper to make you go left off the highway or gets up on your right and turns left. And then you would go off into the right area off the highway. I remember looking at this video with you at some point and to the right of your driver was some kind of a barricade. Yeah, it was the concrete uh, separation. Uh, that area, that stretch of uh, the turnpike parallels I-95. So um, my client was actually driving down the road with cars going in the correct lane just to his right. And the cars, uh, they were headed north like he was, but he was in the southbound lane of the Florida turnpike. So he had cars without any separation uh, coming dead on semis because it's in midnight and a lot of trucks drive at night. So, of course, they're going 70. He's going 70. You can imagine what would happen with 140 miles of uh, miles per hour of collision. Sure. So the trooper did a pit maneuver and got your guy off the road? Got him off the road, but then my client started driving. This time he's uh, driving the correct way in the southbound lane. He didn't stop. He, uh, and then so another trooper had to come up and physically push his car into the woods beside the highway. What happened next? Gosh, that sounds like a prosecutor's question. What happened next? I won the trial. Oh, just the like jury, that. The jury found him not guilty. Well, as they should. <laughs> of course. Well, what happened next was he was ordered out of the car at gunpoint. 
And when the uh, trooper walked up to his car with a gun and pointed at him, he did the only thing he knew how to do at that point and raised the driver's window, leaving all three of the other windows down. Uh, the troopers then got him out of the car. He had wet his pants. Uh, he couldn't stand up. He told the troopers he thought he was on Indian Town Road, which is a two lane for part of the, the way. And he thought he was going east west headed home on Indian Town Road instead of going north south on the Florida Turnpike. Um, so I, I told somebody it's the only DUI I've ever had, and I've been doing them other than when I was a judge for 11 years. I've been doing them 40 years. And of course, as uh, DUI lawyers, we all try to minimize our clients' uh, inebriation or impairment. In this case, I actually uh, tried to uh, emphasize his impairment to a degree even more than the prosecutor because it uh, played into our defense. And your defense was? Well, our defense was uh, involuntary intoxication. Yes, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, he was impaired, but he was not impaired by alcohol. He was impaired by an unknown drug that obviously somebody must have given him. Uh, my client was, I'm not calling him a choir boy, but he was pretty much either an altar boy or a choir boy or a uh, just a beautiful young man, human being with a working on his PhD in, in uh, psychology, uh, never been in trouble in his life. He's not a drinker or a drug addict, at least according to everybody that knew him and his parents. Uh, mild mannered, uh, meek, um, uh, not the kind of guy you would expect to uh, go out partying on a Monday night when he had work the next day and get messed up. So the defense was basically involuntary intoxication that he doesn't know who drugged him. He doesn't know how he was drugged or what he was drugged with. But my expert uh, was able to say that the signs of impairment were not of alcohol because the whole time, keep in mind, he drove 11 miles on the Florida Turnpike without a collision the wrong way. And for four and a half miles, he was videotaped and the videotape showed a driver not weaving, not swerving, not alternating his speed, not uh, braking erratically, any of the signs that the uh, cops use to uh, uh, detect uh, intoxicated drivers. Yet he was so impaired that he literally didn't know where he was. So, so that was the defense, involuntary intoxication. And I uh, put him on the witness stand and the jury liked him. I love the kid. He's 30 something, but compared to me, he's a kid. And I, that's when I knew I was going to win the case when, when, when I can look at a client and I, I believe them and they have a valid defense. Uh, I'm not ashamed to try the case or to put them on the witness stand because I think I can make the jury uh, feel the same way I do. Cliff, what kind of an expert did you, did you look for and did you find? Well, uh, you know, psychiatrists are known for prescribing and knowing all about uh, medications and pharmaceuticals, but uh, through your contacts, I was able to uh, find a local psychologist who also was trained and had many, many years of experience with uh, subjects, patients mainly, who were under the influence of various drugs, who had attempted suicide, um, and unbeknownst to me until this case, uh, I found out that psychologists receive extensive training in these pharmaceuticals and their effects on the human body. And um, maybe they can't, uh, they can't prescribe drugs like a psychiatrist, but uh, I didn't know this, they can actually recommend to their treating physician, the patient's treating physician, a specific drug that they think would improve uh, um, their symptoms. So, uh, and this, psych put, this psychologist was able to help you educate the jury on what sort of symptoms one might expect from different kinds of drugs. Absolutely. Um, the judge would not allow me uh, to have him uh, tell the jury what he saw when he viewed the video combined with what he read in the depositions of the troopers, 
in other words, I had to connect the dots between what you would expect from somebody under what's called a sedative hypnotic, which is an extremely dangerous drug, the that's, illegal forms. That's like a roofie. Uh, the illegal form is a roofie. The, the minor forms that you get prescriptions for could be a Lunesta Sonata or Sonesta and uh, Ambient. But the date rape drugs are the dangerous uh, pills that are manufactured, used to be manufactured here, and now they're manufactured in other countries. But of course, they flood through Mexico because they make them down there too. Okay, so this expert witness was uh, somebody that didn't know your client, didn't view your client, didn't talk about your client's video, but just helped educate the jury about why a person under alcohol would have different behaviors and different symptoms than a person that was under the influence of a sedative, um, what did you call it? Sedative hypnotic. Sedative hypnotic. Absolutely. Uh, bingo. The uh, expert was able to testify that someone, not that my client, obviously, because he couldn't apply it to the facts of this case, but that someone who was intoxicated by alcohol couldn't drive a car in a straight, unswerving manner for 11 miles, especially if it was combined with another drug. And I think the prosecutor made the mistake of asking him if the combination of alcohol and the sedative hypnotic uh, could impair him. Well, of course it could impair him. It would impair him so bad that he, he couldn't have gone one mile, much less uh, 11 miles. Well, I remember so, when you and I looked at this videotape together before, way before you tried the case, we both thought there was something else going on here, not alcohol, because his driving was so good. The only thing wrong with his driving was he was going the wrong way on the turnpike and he wasn't pulling over for the cop behind him. Exactly. And then another cop, uh, another trooper came uh, in his lane head on to try and get him to swerve off the road. And my client just kept going right straight. And the trooper actually had to swerve and then do a U-turn and, and catch up with the, the two cars that were uh, the trooper chasing my client. And well, of course I'm it was fleeing one of the charges wasn't just DUI but it was fleeing and eluding which carries a 15-year prison sentence up to 15 years for high speed fleeing and eluding and it, and it probably should if my client had truly been drunk he probably should have gone to prison he he almost killed uh well not only himself but he could have killed a family he could have it, there could have been a chain reaction in the middle of the night there on the turnpike and it's a extremely serious um offense but my guy wasn't guilty and the troopers had were testified in the depositions and at trial that in all their years, which amounted to about 40 years of work in the turnpike in 95, they had never seen a case like this, which gave added credibility to the defense because the defense was terribly unusual. It, it was an unusual defense I've never used before. I've never seen it used. Um, and so that their testimony dovetailed with the fact that the defense was so unusual. And your client behaved as a, he drove as if he was completely unaware that there was a police officer behind him with lights and siren. That was the weirdest thing. And the way to explain that was the psychologist said that there's uh, been many, many, many examples of people driving in between cities and between states of getting in their car and driving until it simply runs out of gas. They don't know where they are, where they're going. But in their mind, uh, in their dream world, in their sedative hypnotic world, they think they know where they're going. They're sure they know where they're going. And this is what we uh, refer to as sleep driving. Sleep driving, absolutely. And, and it sounds wacky, but I'm sure there are lots of people that don't report it because they're embarrassed. But there's lots and lots of examples in the literature and uh, I've seen it just even before and after I took this case, I've seen it reported in the news because it's such a strange occurrence that we don't understand it. And even the expert said it, we don't fully understand how they could have their fine motor skills like they do and yet be literally in another world, in a dream state almost. Well, props to you, my friend. You did a great job last week and you got the right verdict. 
Thank you. And um, my client was such a nice young man, and he's got a second chance at life and a second chance at chance at his career now. So that uh, is really uh, makes me feel good uh, that my work resulted in some a good outcome. And the judge and the clerks and the bailiffs and the prosecutor all saw that you can win the unwinnable case. Even after 17 years, baby. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us today. Okay, thank, thank you, you for, for having tuning me. in, folks. This has been the Kessler Law Firm podcast, and we'll see you again soon.